name's Amy Dresser, and I'm a photo retoucher, and I'm at Luminance 2012. I think the future of photography is completely unpredictable. I can only speak for myself, and I, I don't even know what the future of it is in my role, like in a week from now or a month. Thanks. Hi, my name's Amy Dresser, and I'm not a photographer. Um, I don't tell stories, and I don't get to um, pick the moment cast the subject or do anything or even remotely close to like pressing the shutter button, um, if that's what it's actually called. I'm not quite sure because I don't know a lot about cameras. Um, I'm a photo retoucher and we're basically parasites uh, in the photo industry uh, and have a reputation for living our lives kind of similarly. Uh, a lot of us are pale, sort of floppy creatures who live in dark rooms, work in the dark, by ourselves and eat a lot of potato tacos and have taught one of our cats to turn the lights off. Um, that's actually just me uh, and I can only speak for myself, so if you don't mind, I'm, I'm gonna be sharing not the life of retouchers in general, but um, just my experiences. I'm gonna share some of my work and um, some of my philosophies. Photography has used to be used to some extent to like be proof of fact, documentation of a moment, um, but on a regular basis, um, I defact them, and I create moments that didn't happen. Luckily for this guy. Uh, <laughs> And the reason I do that is, um, you know, basically photographers are paying me money to do that. Um, they, I help them lie to you, um, and that's my job. It's a little bit weird, I know. Um, the other reason is because as human beings, uh, we're pretty critical bitches. <laughs> so um, that's, that's what we get to do. <laughs> we get to criticize things, but also because maybe we didn't want lipstick on this woman's tooth, and maybe because the model didn't get a lot of rest the night before, and then maybe because just zits happen, <laughs> nobody likes them. Uh, we didn't build enough background for a layout, or shoot enough background for a layout, rather. And because for some reason we don't want this lady to be wearing a bracelet, and while we're there, let's get rid of all her arm hair. And we don't like her hair either for some reason. And is that a nicotine patch? <laughs> let's get rid of it. Uh, I don't know what's wrong with that guy's foot. <laughs> And my personal favorite, the people that are overly concerned with a half of one baby's nipple showing. So, can we get rid of that too? <laughs> Thank you! <laughs> World's gonna be much better now. <laughs> so, uh, now photographers, uh, instead of, like basically, retouching was kind of more for like practical little resolutions, but retouching is not a secret anymore. Photoshop's widely known. There's children who are using Photoshop. I don't know if they have legal copies or not, but that's not really my problem. So photographers are not really using us as insurance anymore as much as they're using us for kind of like steroids. And uh, now together, collaborating with photographers and retouchers, we can tell bigger stories, we can enhance photos instead of just fix them. Um, we can kind of just explode the boundaries of photography um, wherever they were before, and also blur the line between photography and illustration, which is uh, my personal favorite part since I have a drawing and painting background. Uh, so some are comfortable with us just only having a subtle influence on an image and some are comfortable with us having a much harder, deeper, crazier influence 
God bless them. Uh, and then there's a few photographers who still, for some reason, are not comfortable with anyone knowing that they have used a retoucher, and to that I uh, have nothing to say. Uh, so, <laughs> I, I, had, I had a client a long time ago tell me to just make it perfect, which uh, I, I think making it perfect, I don't know, perfect is just a shitty word, shitty concept, it's completely relative. There's no way to like make my perfect and someone else's perfect match up, so why are we even gonna bother? Uh, and it reminds me of when I was a kid and uh, I spilled something on the kitchen floor and when I cleaned up the spot, the spot where I cleaned and the rest of the floor, there was such a contrast <laughs> that I decided to clean the whole floor. And, uh, but uh, I was so enthralled by the difference that I left a couple tiles in the middle of the floor so my mom could see like what a good job I did at scrubbing this floor. Uh, I wanted her to appreciate my progress, but um, she didn't appreciate my progress. <laughs> it turns out that kind of made her angry. So that brings me to my first main philosophy in retouching, which is to not actually make it perfect. Uh, so, and I'm not talking about just keeping a prized zit on someone's nose and making the rest of their face look impossibly perfect, but to just leave, leave the character, leave the information. Um, it only has to look good from a distance, and up close, you can still see pores, you can still see hairs, you can still see some wrinkles. I'm just getting rid of what's distracting. Uh, it is a print image, and we're a little bit more critical of it than a moving image. Uh, so I am pushing it a little bit further than, I guess, what some people would consider okay. <laughs> but uh, if you look at these close-ups, like, they still have the integrity of the person behind them. And so I really am fond of keeping information over getting rid of information, and I like character over perfection. And so unlike some people here today that might say that they picked up a Nikon one day and it changed their lives. Um, my story is like, I found a grout brush once. <laughs> it's not very glamorous. <laughs> so um, one of the ways I can get away with having this much detail uh, on a face is to just adjust the skin to have just an evenness in tone, color, and saturation. Oh yeah, I forgot to say, uh, I, I, if you're gonna lie, make it a detailed lie. <laughs> Don't make Gaussian blur lies. <laughs> so with this skin tone trick, I, I'm doing, it's doing a lot of the heavy lifting and making an image appear to look perfect. And so I can keep the information, but like under like this like sort of coat, coat of like even skin tone, uh, everything looks a lot more perfect, but the actual texture and everything still stays there. And it kind of just marries the image with itself. Uh, you'll notice some of these I make uh, a lot darker because I'm a little bit addicted to the information. I want it showing. So with this guy, you can still see his five o'clock shadow. You can still see the freckles and lines around his face. And uh, this boy, you can see all of his freckles and it also makes my other hobby of painting highlights on skin show up more. Painting white on white doesn't really do that much. <laughs> so um, I swear I'm not obsessed with giving people a tan, even though this guy, I admit, I went a little bit far with. Um, and to prove my point, I made a sample slide for you guys of how not everyone can look good with a tan. <laughs> See, it's not for everyone. Uh, and so there's this one guy that I was trying to make a tan, uh, I was asked to, and I, I accidentally changed his race. Because I just like didn't look back at the original enough, and so I had to scale it back. And then that made the photographer curious, is like, well, can you change anybody's race? <laughs> and so I did this picture, there's no added pieces, this is just one still frame, and I try to make her Chinese. Uh, so a little bit about my process. Um, <sighs> my process. <laughs> uh, like these three things um, just 
working on skin, working on color, and affecting the mood of the image. Some of them have, like, the three things combined can have a really subtle difference, and sometimes the three things combined uh, will have a much more dramatic one. And I'm never trying to purposely hijack an image from the photographer's original vision, but I admit that it does happen sometimes. Um, sometimes they're okay with it, and sometimes they're not. But I'm usually using the, the source photo as grounds for my inspiration, and I try to just continue where the photographer left off and finish the race for them. So um, I broke down an image that I worked on in a couple of slides so you can see a little bit about my progress um, from start to finish. Um, this is a raw image, and this is not that uh, untypical of, of something I would get. And this is going to be super boring for you, and it's going to be only slightly less boring than if you're actually watching me do this for two hours <laughs> in real life because everything I do is in such little micro movements that you're probably not even going to see that much of a difference from slide to slide. So the first step I would take would be just doing a global color adjustment, sort of just point me in a direction. And I actually just get at this point by like pulling up a curves layer and just cranking it in a few directions and see if something pretty happens. And, um, and then I get rid of the no-brainer stuff, something that nobody's going to have a problem with me getting rid of. And from here until the end of the image retouching process, it's almost just like I look for the most distracting thing, and I minimize it, and then the next most distracting thing pops up, and I minimize that. And I do that until I essentially run out of time, budget, or get a grip on my OCD. And all the while, I'm adding a little bit of a sheen to the skin. And then at the very end, I might do a push just to get it like a little bit over the, the edge. And uh, it's very subtle, like little by little, you don't see that much of a difference. But this is the final image. And just to remind you, that was the raw. So I've assembled a handful of slides here to show the range of things you can do with just working on skin and color and mood. And it can, again, be a subtle difference or a dramatic one. And the things that I consider mood things, I usually do as people who work in Photoshop, uh, I do them on top because they're kind of the more negotiable things. So uh, a photographer or my client, whoever it is, is probably going to have less of a problem maybe getting rid of like something stupid that happened with someone's clothing versus me like adding uh, purple streaks on that guy. <laughs> so uh, this brings me to uh, talking about what happens when I do get feedback from a client. Kind of, it comes in three camps. There's like, they tell me to do something and I do it because I essentially agree with it. Or I do it even though I disagree with it to prove that it's going to look bad. <laughs> or uh, the third thing that happens is like they want me to do something that I'm not comfortable with. And the way I try to handle that is to disguise whatever they're deciding is the problem in like the most, um, you know, gentle and delicate way possible. And so what that means is that I end up using a lot more illusions than actual, like, pure modification. So um, in the case of this girl, instead of actually trying to make her look thinner, she's a fit, she's like, she's actually a plus size model. So, like, she's supposed to be big. I'm actually just going to make her skin look better. And it does all that I feel like it needs to have done to it. And, 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 it's, and shading. And like with this image, I did tuck in her stomach a little bit, but the rest is all shading. And so just with using shadows and highlights, I can carve a lot more dimension in a person. And it just gives the illusion of a little bit, uh, well, it makes it a, a, a pretty picture in my opinion. But like, I feel like it does make some people look a little bit tighter. 
And this, and the same thing happens with highlights. Like she's, she's like totally highlighted up. If you have a soft highlight, it kind of represents like a flatter area of skin. You make a really hard highlight like on her hip and you can give the illusion of a bone being there. You can make people a little bit more muscular. She's pretty muscular to begin with. I was just going a little bit further. And this is all dodging and burning. Like, I'm not airbrushing. I kind of hate that word because even though I'm using my eye-hand coordination, and so I'm legitimately painting, but I'm not just painting, painting. I'm just carving with light and shadow. And with these techniques, I can make somebody have cleavage. And if I'm going to do that kind of stuff on a, a body, you know that I'm going to do it on a face, too, because I love portraits so much. And essentially, we have a lot of muscles in our face, so carving muscles on the face, you make somebody look uh, a lot more dramatic with their facial expressions. You make this guy much angrier. <laughs> and make this woman much more devastated. And so this is basically my ideal image. Like, I would love to just work on uh, portraits that aren't meant to be pretty necessarily. Um, but my, my other thing that I love to do is working on athletes. Um, not only do I get to celebrate the, the body that they've like worked for and enhance it, um, but I get to do my fun, I like to make people have muscles hobby, and I get to like make people sweat, <laughs> which works well with the whole highlight hobby. And I can make people look like superheroes. And, uh, and sometimes the art director says, like, I, I want her to look godlike. <laughs> and sometimes the art director <laughs> it says, uh, can we hide their genitals from showing through their wetsuit? <laughs> I'm not going to show you that slide. Um, so, uh, this image is actually made of several images, and this brings me to the next section of, of my presentation, where instead of just enhancing an image, we're assembling one, we're creating one out of several frames to make one image that couldn't happen in the same moment or just didn't happen in the same moment or frame. And uh, so, while some people would say that the other form of retouching is like, making real things look perfect, like these are making uh, fake things look real, relatively speaking. <laughs> um, and so this is clearly a composite, uh, and it's quite, I don't know how I got stuck with doing such a pink job, like I'm totally not a pink person. Um, so with compositing, like we can do subtle things, like just swap a head, because this Allergy medicine needs to be marketed to the other side of the planet where there isn't blondes. Um, you can make someone have crazy hair. Uh, you can add a new background to an image. And maybe de-emphasize someone's boobs. <laughs> you can add a background and modify a suit that hasn't been finished being designed. And you can composite like a couple part body parts, make a, a, a slightly different pose. Um, and you can do the same thing with animals. Because <laughs> maybe they weren't 100% cooperative on set, um, but this little butterfly totally rocked it. <laughs> and then there's just things we're just like fixing a set, um, which took 30 hours of my life. <laughs> And then there's the, another kind where we're just processing one frame multiple times to sort of get like the best sort of look for the sky, the mountains, and the middle ground and the subjects. And here's another similar one. And maybe you didn't have room to make the kind of environment you wanted to have. And um, because things don't really levitate and glow and glitter like that on command. <laughs> and because fairies don't actually exist. 
Um, and because some things are dangerous to do, like um, making people's backpacks explode or their laptop cases or their shoulder bags. <laughs> So all these pieces are just shot separately and I collage them together to make it look like a real image. And then using all my fancy light and shadow techniques and color, I try to make everything blended and make it look like a real scene, so to speak, if that would be real. So here's a, a breakdown of a composite image and, and the steps to make it happen. Um, a lot of the pieces are just adjusted to make them match each other. Because while this was, is technically shot in a lake, it's like over a period of time. So there's like the lights different from uh, subject to subject. And then adding all kinds of effects. So not everything is shot as ideally as this was. Uh, sometimes things were shot with the intention of looking this great, but like maybe they, you know, had a lot of problems on the set and so I actually get called a lot to like sort of rescue jobs that like weren't necessarily prepared for well uh, and pull like sort of rabbits out of hats. Um, ideally I would like to be the equivalent of someone just like using a feather duster on an image and just like call it a day. Like have my cat turn the lights off and go to bed. But um, in reality, I'm a little bit more like Harvey Keitel's character in Pulp Fiction, where I'm hired to like clean up the dead bodies um, from the back of a car. Uh, and so some things aren't that extreme, but maybe an image is just blown out. And uh, maybe we want an image to be more blown out. And uh, maybe it was the end of the day and the sun went down and it doesn't look like daytime anymore. And they put on a gel and it made her face look funny. Um, and maybe there was a much more extreme lighting problem. <laughs> and the photographer was like, I just thought you could just like bring back uh, the skin tone. I was like, it, it, I have to make it happen <laughs> manually. And maybe the hairdresser ran out of ideas uh, in a bad way. <laughs> and um, this lady's too old. This guy is just not old enough. And uh, sometimes uh, there's some more legitimate reasons to doing this other than just people being finicky and unprepared. In this case, this guy was photographed wearing this wetsuit for a catalog for Tear, and um, they had modified the design. Um, and so he had like a more absorbent material that was non-reflective, and then they end up making the whole leg more rubbery. And then he broke a record wearing the suit, so they wanted to make sure that when it was in the catalog, it reflected the actual um, product and how it would be once they were ready to sell it. And so not only do I have to change the sheen of the fabric, but I'm like adding water droplets on it just to like, you know, make it look a lot more believable. And because people don't actually have the body of pinup girls, I feel weird about that one. And because um, maybe a fitness model is actually like so fit that she's intimidating the target audience for the product that she's posing for. So we have to make her look a little bit softer and less muscular. And they said, while we're at it, can we make her prettier? <laughs> I felt really uncomfortable all of it. Um, but it, the reason I end up doing some of these jobs is because uh, while retouching is expensive, sometimes having a new photo shoot is way more expensive. And um, I just, I'm proud that this client would be like, just tell me if you can do it and it's okay if you can't. <laughs> And because, like, also, we can't keep up with Katy Perry's hair color, and we also, like, can't, you know, we can't afford to book her, so we're just using, like, stock images to build her body. So they want to know, like, can we make her do this um, with all these images, make sure she has blue hair, and we want one piece to go over her shoulder, and we want uh, the other in front, and we need the cotton candy dress and blue shoes. 
And so, meanwhile, I submit this image, like, totally worried that Katy Perry's gonna have a problem, but all she wanted to do is to open one eye slightly more. <laughs> that was it, so, whew. <laughs> and uh, sometimes you get in an argument with uh, the guys who make CG horses for this, and they think it's easier for you to paint the mane and the body hair on these horses, and you think, it's easier for them to generate it. <laughs> and, and because I'm really bad at arguing, I lose and I have to paint it. And a lot of people have like a little bit more confidence in me than I do, so while they see it as me doing magic, which is super dangerous, <laughs> and it's also just super unfair because it took me like 12 hours to do this thing that was just sort of thrown at me and uh, so instead of me just going like, bing, like it's much more like I'm crying in my pajamas at six in the morning because I haven't figured out how to do it yet. That brings me almost to the end. And <laughs> basically I just see the marriage between photography and retouching as like kind of uh, a limitless um, relationship. We can kind of make anything happen between the two of us. And, and if I can like, give Weird Al's horse Weird Al hair, then we can kind of do, we can take over the universe, assuming the universe can be taken over by an image. <laughs> and that's it, guys. Is there any questions? Is that your part? I, yeah, that's my job. <laughs> so I know you've worked for a number of very, very famous photographers, so I have kind of a two-part question. The first. Are you kind of shocked sometimes at how bad their photography is? And then the second part would be, <laughs> the, the second part would be, uh, you, list you've, names. No, don't <laughs> list names. You, you've helped define kind of the look of a lot of people's photography. Do you get a little pissed off that you're not credited as a creator of the image since it is such a col collaboration? Um, I'll maybe answer the second question first because uh, I actually don't want attention. So like it's like. I might have some weird knack for uh, laboring over an image until the wee hours in the morning, but uh, I like being the person behind the person who's behind the camera. Like, I don't want attention, and I like that this job I can hang out by. Like, you guys are ruining my job by making me do this in front of people. <laughs> So I don't really feel like I want credit. I, like, I want to be treated fairly. Like, I don't want to be treated like a robot or a magician. And um, I want to be paid fairly. And that's like where it ends for me as far as that. Uh, and then the first part, uh, I don't necessarily know photographers' reputations before I work for them. And in the case of some, like I just didn't know who they were at all, and then I just blindly started working for them, and then I didn't know that they were a big deal. Uh, which is convenient, because then I don't have to like stress out about right. it. Uh, so it's, it's more like, uh, it's not shocked, because I didn't have a, a standard that I assumed that they were at. I just was like, all right, I'll work on this image. Okay, but how about when you see like a celebrity unretouched, are you like, wow, they're really ugly in real life? No, because I'm already, the, I'm the one retouching it, so I like, when I open it up, it's like almost never a shock, because I know what everyone looks like unretouched. Like, yeah, that's a good point. So it's, it's usually everyone else who's shocked and not me because like I've already, I've already seen who has like stretch marks and, <laughs> and, and what girls have an actual hair coming out of their chest. <laughs> Amy Dresser. <laughs>